This video has the potential to be very controversial. There's no way of, you know, getting around that when you're comparing a modern population to an ancient population that they're connected to on some historical or cultural basis. These types of topics are very sensitive when it comes to any group that might claim descent from an ancient population, be it the Greeks identifying with classical Greece, Albanians identifying with Illyria, and, you know, everyone identifying with ancient Egypt, whatever. Now don't get me wrong, I have a hard time believing that the average Italian guy is actually emotionally invested in ancient Rome. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I understand that Rome has a really big presence in Italian history and culture, but it's just to say that whatever Romabu LARPing there is, you know, I'd hope it's mostly contained to low quality online discussions on 4chan and things like that. It seems like on, you know, that side of the internet, when it comes to this discussion, the only two positions you can hold is either Nordicism or some sort of, like, med supremacist position where you think that there's unbroken continuity between ancient, you know, Mediterranean civilizations and their modern counterparts. But both of these conceptions are entirely wrong. Now, I made a video a little while back that talked about foreign admixture in Southern Europe broadly. I looked at a few studies and made some Global 25 models. If you don't know what Global 25 is, it's a database of ancient and modern DNA samples in the format of PCA coordinates. You can use this to infer admixture in populations through various calculators such as Vaha Duo JS and InMonti. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to read about it or use it yourself because I'll be using it yet again in this video. To summarize what I proved in my previous video, specifically the parts pertaining to Rome, the Imperial Romans received an influx of immigration from other places around the Mediterranean, which changed the genetic makeup of modern Italians from that point forward. Then there was of course an influx of Germanic-related ancestry in the northern parts of Italy during late antiquity and the Middle Ages. So therefore, the Near Eastern admixture in Italians, you know, it greatly predates the Moors, despite conventional wisdom. I also showed that the total amount of foreign-related admixture isn't as crazy as people think. However, my biggest regret is that I only used G25 to check for, like, Epipaleolithic through Early Bronze Age-related ancestry. Now, those types of distal models don't really tell you that much to begin with. You know, so what? Italians have X amount of Neolithic farmer ancestry and X amount of Natufian ancestry. You know, those those uh, signals come from a variety of places, you know, way after the Epipaleolithic and Neolithic. So that's why in this video, I'm going to try to roughly find out how Roman Italians really are and what the rest of their ancestry comes from. But it kind of raises the question, what do we even really mean by Roman in the first place? I feel like if our standard was just living under the Roman Empire, then a lot of people would have, have you know, had a lot of Roman ancestry, myself included because the majority of my ancestry comes from Britain. So we have to have a more stringent standard for it to even be worth talking about. Obviously, Italians have direct ancestry from Imperial Romans, you, you know, the citizens from Imperial Rome that lived on the Italian peninsula, but as I stated in the previous video, there was a Near Eastern shift in many of the samples from that period. What we're really looking for isn't exactly Roman ancestry per se, but more like Italic or Latin ancestry, who were the, you know, original founders of Rome. But who were the Italic people, and what's the genetic history of the Italian peninsula in general? Well, we're going to start a few thousand years back, you know, during the Neolithic and Enneolithic, this region was home to various farming populations. Samples from this period indicate that, like most people living in Western, Central, and Southern Europe during this time, they were closely related to people from Neolithic Anatolia, and had some ancestry related to, uh, you know, earlier Mesolithic hunter-gatherers as well. However, there's even a Sardinian outlier that has a, a North African profile, which shows that North Africans and perhaps even Middle Easterners interacted with Southern Europe for a lot longer than people expect. Now, during the Bronze Age, there's an influx of ancestry from Eastern Europe, specifically from steppe herders that can, you know, ultimately be traced back to the Shredni Stog culture. These earliest samples include bell beakers from what would become Northern Italy, who likely introduced steppe ancestry into other Bronze Age populations in the peninsula, but even then, they're relatively low in steppe ancestry when compared to Northern Europeans. Southern Europeans have always had less steppe ancestry, perhaps because Southern Europe was populated by early European farmers, um, you know, earlier on, and they had more dense and frequent settlements. So when steppe-related people came in and intermixed with them, the proportion of EEF to steppe became higher than those in the north. But ultimately, the bell beakers were not the steppe-related people to have, you know, the greatest genetic or linguistic impact on the Italian peninsula. 
It's been theorized that the Italic branch and the Celtic branch of the Indo-European family are closely related to one another and perhaps come from a common ancestor, Proto-Italo-Celtic. Whether or not this is true, it's very likely that the Italic and Celtic languages are both associated with the spread of Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age, Central European archaeological cultures such as the Urnfield and Hallstatt phenomena. Both of these are closely related to previous Central European cultures with a significant step genetic element, such as the Tumulus and Unatice cultures, which ultimately traced their origins to the Corded Ware and were closely related to bell beakers. Now, the most relevant to the Italics and the spread of the step genetic component in the Italian peninsula is the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age Urnfield culture, specifically the Proto Villanovan subset. In the coming centuries, other cultures would be born from the Proto-Villanovan subset in the Italian peninsula, especially the Villanovan culture, which was essentially the beginning of, uh, you know, what we would call the Etruscans. Now, one misconception I'd like to clear up is that, you know, just because the Etruscans did not speak an Indo-European language, you know, that means that they were unconnected to the Urnfield culture and that they were basically just Neolithic farmers, and this isn't true. They had significant amounts of steppe ancestry as well, around 25 to 30 percent throughout their existence as a distinct culture. We also see North African-related outlier samples here as well from pretty early on. And of course, around the time the Villanovan culture pops up, so do Italic people all across the peninsula. However, the most important of these Italic tribes were the Latins, and they inhabited the region known as Latium, and they were a part of the Latial archaeological culture at first. Now, we actually have samples of these Latins from the cities of Ardea, Rome, and Praeneste. I also decided to throw in Beauville Ernica in there as well. I'm not sure if it was technically a part of Latium or Umbria, but it was rather close and, you know, it was certainly Italic, if not Latin. So as we can see, they're more or less similar to Etruscans with around 25 to 30% step ancestry on average, the rest being, you know, EEF derived. And as we can see, there's also some Phoenician-related outliers. So again, most of these samples are from around the city of Rome, you know, when it was founded. And even then, we can see a little bit of Near Eastern influence in some of these samples, which just goes to show that foreign influence goes back further than a lot of people think. Speaking of which, on top of Punic colonies in Sicily and Sardinia, there were Greek states in southern and central Italy, there were Gauls to the north as well, and, yeah, Pigians, I hope I'm saying that right, who occupied the heel region of, of the boot of Italy, if we want to look at it that way, and they... Uh, almost certainly came from the Illyrians, which were Paleo-Balkan speakers, um, and the ancestors of the Albanians. Now, I doubt that these foreigners that inhabited Iron Age Italy actually had a large genetic impact in terms of imperial and modern-day Italians. The Greeks, however, had a very large cultural impact from very early on. When we think of Romans, we often think of the Greeks being closely tied to them. People often refer to things related to them as, you know, Greco-Roman. In reality, the original Latins and Italic people in general had very little to do with the Greeks aside from being Indo-European. It was culture and mythology that they adopted, you know, after their interactions with the Greeks that made them Greco-Roman. If you were wondering where the Trojan origins for Romans might fit into all of this, you know, that's basically where it comes from. They essentially just identified with uh, Troy upon hearing about the Trojan War from the Greeks. In my opinion, there's no real evidence to support a literal Trojan origin for Romans. By the 4th and 3rd centuries BC, just a few hundred years after the founding of Rome, they already saw significant territorial gains from the Latin and Samnite Wars, and even conquered the Etruscans, and by the 2nd century after the Punic and Macedonian Wars, they had already taken all of the Italian peninsula, the territories of Carthage, you know, in North Africa and Iberia, as well as Greece and Western Anatolia. So we see this trend in the Roman Republic where they start conquering Latins, then other Italic tribes, then, you know, then Etruscans, then, you know, the Punics and Greek settlements, and then Gauls, etc. So even before the Roman Empire technically existed, the precedent was already set that the state of Rome was essentially a multicultural and multi-ethnic uh, uh, thing, despite the founders of Rome being of one culture and one ethnic group, the Latini. So at the end of the Roman Republic and at the beginning of the Roman Empire is when we start to see the genetic shift towards Near Easterners after all of their... Uh, territorial gains in the Near East and Northern Africa. So here are the source populations I'm going to be using to model the Romans. I figured I'll explain why I use the, the ones I did in, in this model, because it's a little more complex than a simple Mesolithic, you know, Bronze Age one. Now, I just want to say this model is uh, very similar 
to one that someone I know made. He has a blog called Genes of the Ancients, and it has a pretty good guide on, on you know, modeling ancient Greeks and Italians. So I'll leave a link to that in the description. Firstly, I made an average of the unmixed uh, Latin samples for the Italic-related source. Keep in mind that because of how similar Etruscans as well as a lot of continental Celts were to the other Italic tribes, this might fill in for any, you know, Iron Age, Italic, Celtic, and Etruscan admixture. We also have an average of various samples from the ancient Aegean representing uh, Greeks around the time of the Roman Empire. Keep in mind that these Greeks were shifted more towards uh, Anatolians and West Asians than Greeks from the Classical Era. Next, we have ancient Croatia and Albania for the Paleo-Balkan-related source. Moving on, we have an ancient Armenian source because this type of ancestry, you know, it definitely had an impact on Southern Europeans, in my opinion, uh, you know, during uh, the Roman Empire. Then for the Near Eastern sources, I have Ashkelon Iron Age II, which is sort of like a Canaanite or Levantine source, and then Tel Karasa, which is an, uh, an antique Arab population from Syria. Keep in mind that both of these are um, uh, distinct populations, but I'm just grouping them as uh, Near Eastern for neatness, basically. We know that the Romans interacted with the Levantines very early on, as well as later when they conquered the Levant, you know, it would become like Judea. And there were also Syrian citizens of Rome. Some of you may know that Rome actually had a Syrian emperor named Elagabalus, who is most famous for syncretizing Arabian sun god worship with Roman religion, basically starting the cult of Sol Invictus or Elagabal. And finally, we have a Canarian guanche sample uh, for, for North African. And now this isn't really an ancient sample, but it's a historical pre-Spanish sample, okay? So it's a good representation of pure North African-related ancestry, even if it's a bit anachronistic. So here are the results. And keep in mind that some of these rows are just averages of multiple individuals from a region and others are just uh, individuals. As we can see, they have significant amounts of Balkan, Greek, West Asian, and even North African admixture, and the percentages of those vary from region to region. Now amongst all groups, the Imperial Greek element seems to be the most impactful. This is something I failed to mention in my previous video on Southern European genetics. I almost made it sound like all of the Near Eastern admixture and Imperial Romans came directly from the Near East, but in reality, a lot of it actually came indirectly from Greece and Anatolia, meaning Greeks had a Near Eastern element, and then the Greeks mixed with the Italic people, resulting in a Near Eastern shift in uh, a lot of the samples. Although that's not to say that there wasn't direct admixture from the Near East and North Africa. Moving on to Italy from late antiquity through the Renaissance, keep in mind the only changes I've made here is that I've added Langobardic and Medieval Slavic sources. The Langobardic is pretty obvious. Uh, we know for a fact that Germanic people, especially the Langobards or Lombards, whatever you want to call them, invaded the Italian peninsula during late antiquity. Keep in mind this source could also fill in for any Germanic ancestry not given to Italians by, by Lombards. Now the Slavic might be a bit confusing, but it makes sense once you realize that there were Slavs introduced uh, to the Eastern Alps in the Middle Ages. If we look at the late antique and early medieval samples, it appears that they all have a, a, a significant Greek shift still. However, as time goes on, you see less of it and more Germanic and even Slavic-related admixture, depending on the region. However, Greek, West Asian, and North African ancestry by no means, you know, just disappeared during this time period. Moving on to modern Italians, which I didn't change the model for, they appear to retain a lot of their ancestry from the medieval period. If you look at the Greek, Near Eastern, and North African admixture, we can see that there's, uh, you know, somewhat of a gradient where northern Italians have less of it, and central and southern Italians have more. What surprised me is that Sicilians didn't have as much of a Near Eastern shift as I thought. Obviously, the Italkim, or, you know, the Italian Jews, have the most Near Eastern and North African-related admixture, but they also appear to have substantial European Mediterranean admixture. Germanic, Paleo-Balkan, and Slavic-related ancestry is especially prevalent in Northern Italians, but a lot of them seem to have re retained Italic-like ancestry, meaning that there still must have been a significant amount of people during the Empire through the Renaissance that still had this kind of ancestry. Lombardy has the highest amount at 50%, and Molise has the lowest at around 8%. Again, I'm kind of surprised it wasn't Sicily or Calabria or something like that that had the lowest. Now, the final thing I want to look at is to see what population is the closest in terms of PCA distance to the Italic tribes. My prediction was that it was going to be the Basque, just because they basically have no foreign admixture, 
and they also have similar step proportions to the early italics because Iberians, including the Basque, have a lot of that southern, you know, European, Celtic, I guess we'd say like Hallstatt, Urnfield, sort of related ancestry. As it turns out, I, I was kind of right. The italics are most similar to northern Spanish, southern French, and the Basque, but also some northern Italian populations as well. So what's the key takeaways from all of this? For one, the Italic people were similar to other groups uh, that were formed in the Iron Age Italian peninsula, and they had little foreign admixture, but were not similar to Northern Europeans in the sense that they had, you know, l lower step admixture than them. In fact, they were genetically closest to Northern Spaniards and Southern French people. A lot of this changed in the Roman Empire in the Middle Ages, where we see the influx of Greeks, Balkanites, you know, Levantines, Syrians, North Africans, and later on, uh, uh, Lombards, and to some extent, South Slavs. However, a lot of Italic-related ancestry still lives on in Italians today. So can we say that the Italians, you know, are the same as the people who founded Rome? No, but we can say that Italians are the product of the original Italic people, and further admixture events that occurred as a result of their expansion, and then later incursions by the Lombards. Therefore, Italians have more or less been in the form they are today since about the early Middle Ages, I'd say. However, I'd say that Italians should be proud of the heritage they have from the Latin people, as they would go on to found one of the greatest empires in all of human history. That's all I really have to say for now. I apologize again for the bad upload schedule, but hopefully I will see you all again very soon. See ya.